We're not too busy to wait on you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity just to wait on you. Thank you for your presence. You may be seated. You may be seated. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Wow, 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 wow. Whew. I'm just trying to contain myself. I, I realize that, hey, listen, you're the one that is going to minister tonight. So don't get caught up too much in the spirit that <laughs> you can't even minister. But we have to go with the flow of the Lord. Uh, all due respect to... The ministers that have gone before me, I honor all those who are ministers in the house, those who are more seasoned than I am. I honor every single younger minister. We honor every single minister on the same level as we are. All the families in the house. I want to thank God for our host, Pastor James Adia. I want to thank God for you, prophetess. Thank you so much for your presence. Pastor Bosse, thank you so much. Reverend Ad Aremu, Reverend Shewun, Reverend Banke, Aremu, we thank you for your presence. Belated, belated happy birthday to you. Do you all know that this month was her birthday? The Holy Spirit didn't tell me. It was Facebook that told me. So you know. I just want you to be clear about that. Okay? I, I really, I'm, I'm excited. And I want you all... Uh, I'll just give a re few recap of things that have been said. One of the things that um, Reverend Banker said, she said, be expectant. Do you all remember her saying, be expectant, and that Jesus is the focus of the gathering tonight. You remember that? Jesus is the focus of the gathering tonight. So be expectant. Jesus is the focus of the gathering. And also we're told by Reverend Sheon that the that the purpose, one of the things, two points. The first one was, what do you, who remembers the first one? God is the one who invited us to worship. And what? The veil needs to be removed. When we come into the presence of God, one of the reasons is so that the veil will be removed. Amen. I want to encourage you, if it is possible, please take either take notes or record with your phone. We have smartphones now. Um, I tr I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to say quite a number of things. Um, and then uh, I'm going to dive right into the message because of... I don't want to waste our time. I want to maximize the time that we have available. I don't know if it's that the mic is very high or it can be reduced a little bit. I not naturally have a loud voice. Okay, amen. A few things before we go further. I just want, uh, there's so much, see, uh, just as a way of preparation for every one of us. When you're in such a, when we're in revival mode or when we gather like this, it's very important, as we have rightly been told, that we'll be expectant. But when you sense the presence of God to, on levels, not, not the usual level, uh, hey, we're, we're, all, we're Christians, yeah, I believe, and we, we, if, if, the, if you sense the presence of God, you will know. Nobody needs to tell you that. It's like there's something different in the atmosphere. And preparation has already gone. Preparation is still going. And so in an atmosphere of the presence of God, it's very Im important that you begin to bring up your needs uh, or, or just begin to talk to him about things. Um, I, when I was told a few months ago that, hey, gonna, do you mind coming to minister? One thing, I began to seek the face of the Lord, that, Lord, what are you saying? And I began to pay the price in terms of fasting, in terms of prayer, in terms of preparation, in terms of seeking God through his word, because uh, my understanding is that, hey, you're going to be ministering to pastors, to church leaders, you're going to minister, obviously to family members and everything like that. And so that kind of like, whoa, uh, that means I have to go deeper. Ah, Holy Spirit. Now, wow, don't mind my vernacular. You know, when you have to go deeper, because if you know um, you have to feed uh, people on a certain level, then you have to go into the deeper place to hear specifically from the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I said earlier on, just to, a way of um, uh, who here, who has, um, who came the farthest? We're family. Is, that, is it okay? Uh, we're family. Please be free. We're family, okay? Uh, who, has, who would say they came the farthest from here? Uh, how far did you come? 
from Wema. Who came farther than Arlington? From where, sir? From not Arlington. Arlington, not Arlington. Okay, so you came from Arlington. I'm blessing you with this, man. This is for you. Um, one of the things that I strongly believe, I strongly believe that in an atmosphere of God's presence, it's very important that we sow seeds. That just sow. Just sow. And it's not just money. Yes, money is important, you know, to stage a conference of this magnitude. We do need funds, obviously. But just as an atmosphere to give, be a blessing with a smile, encourage someone, okay? Now, uh, I already given Pastor his book, and I've given, so I, I knew Reverend Aremu, you were going to be here, and uh, Reverend Banke, you'll be here. I didn't know the children would be here, but it's all good, all the same, so, you know, as, as Scout Lord, they say, always be prepared in season and out of season, so I'm prepared, and no shaking, I'm prepared. Who... Who uh, ministers here? Uh, who, are, who would we say, and no, no offense, who has been oh, the first person to arrive? Who was the first person? The other than Pastor and myself, who are the first? Okay. Ah, double honor. Arlington. So I'm, I'm going to do something. Do you mind? Uh, this is for you. I, I could come over to you, but I want to respect the recording that is going on. Uh, I want to respect it. This, you have two books, one because you came from North Arlington and one because you came, you are the first person to come. Now, you can be Libra and decide to bless someone here, okay? You can, it's, it's your call. No, you don't, don't bless the Aremus, oh. don't bless the Aremus. You are not allowed to bless the Aremus. You, you are not allowed to bless them. You are not allowed to bless them. And the reason why I said that is because they already have, they're going to get their own copy already, okay? Um, also, so, so I have one for Reverend Shewon Aremu. I have another book for Reverend Banker Remo, and I guess I have three books for the children, okay, because they're serious. So that makes it five. I already wrote their name. I also have another book for, I have it here somewhere. I'm going to give it to you before the day is over. I think, I believe I have another book. Okay, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. I have a book for uh, Pastor Mrs. Bosse. A day, yeah, yeah. I believe I signed the cop your copy. I'm going to give you a copy of your book, okay? Um, it's somewhere. <laughs> I know I signed it. I gave you, can you imagine? I already gave you. So he's, your, the copy of your book, ma'am, is with him. Okay. So we have, who, who will we say here, uh, are you a minister in the house? The youngest, I mean, someone who just started ministry not too long ago. If you're a minister in this house and you've, who is, who is the minister here? Pastor Charles. Pastor Charles. Okay, so I have a copy. Okay, this is your book. Uh, as when I say the youngest man who has been in ministry the shortest time. So that is for you. Now, other, who has been in ministry? Okay. Hey, you have to bless another person with the book if you, if you, okay. So, do all due respect. Now, who would say has been in ministry and extend the longest except in a period of time. Okay. You have double blessing. Okay. <laughs> double blessing to you. You can decide to bless someone else with the book. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Okay. So that is that. We're going to get straight into the word. Thank you for your patience and uh, thank you for receiving that. Now, I will have, I, I trust for all the, I'm going to have a, every single day, the person who comes earliest, Obviously, if it's the same people that come again, you're not getting a book tomorrow. There will be more books again tomorrow. There will be more books again on Friday to the, the youngest in the house. And also for the leadership of this house, there will be some books I'll give to pastor for those who are in leadership. And the youth leader, the youths in the house, I will make sure that every single young person in this house that you get a copy of the book. Okay? Praise the Lord. It's a book I wrote in 2015. And um, my name is, again, I'm not going to go into telling you more about myself today. Uh, I, I want to go straight into the world. In the course of the next few days, uh, I probably would do that. Now, just uh, as way of overview of what will be happening the next three days, what I'll be ministering on. Today, the message will be uh, on the role of prayer in prioritizing and strategizing for effectiveness and efficiency in ministries for obviously pastors and church leaders. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. And, but I'll come back to that later. The role of prayer. 
the role of prayer in prioritizing and strategizing for effectiveness and efficiency in ministry. And the, 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 so, so if you're called into ministry, and not necessarily just ministry, for these principles, you can use them for your life. If you, whether you're a student, you can use these principles that we'll share today in your life relating to prayer. And tomorrow, by God's grace, we're going to, uh, the focus of the word that will be shared with the acts is of God. Can you say that with me? The acts and the ways of God. That's what, that would be what the focus, my focus will be tomorrow. And what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart on Friday, he, he literally said the word, uh, my day. I was like, okay, I don't hear messages like, what does my day mean? I was asking the Holy Spirit. What it means is that it's your day of visitation, it's your day to receive. And the strength of Friday will be basically a lot of prayer, worship music, a lot of prophet prophetic declarations, a lot of um, just prayer, prophetic declarations, prophecy, and just more or less, uh, I won't use the word hands-on ministration specifically. Uh, the, the Lord basically, is, it's your day. It's your day. Okay? Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, the today's um, message, the the guiding thought, uh, and I know, and I, I thank God for what uh, our pastor who sang that last song said. That I don't mind waiting, and and I'll tell you why I'm thanking God for that song towards the end of the message. You see, um, today the the guiding thought uh, the Lord laid on my heart is that a receptive mind. You and I need to have a receptive mind. If you're a minister of God or you're not even a minister of God, whoever you are, it's very important that we all have a receptive mind. And I'll try and give a definition of what a receptive mind. A mind that is flexible, a mind that is flexible to the Holy Spirit of God, anchored on God's word and prayer. I'll say that again. A mind, a receptive mind basically means a mind that is flexible and receptive to the Holy Spirit, to, to receptive to the Holy Spirit of God, anchored in prayer and God's word. Amen. A, a classic case study or, or a person who exhibited that trait. You know, when you think of the man Apollos and you think of Apostle Paul, you know, it's a great thing of honor if your name is put side by side with someone whose name you know is great is that is that a correct assessment for example if you if if they put the name of carl lewis and um usain bolt if you put both names together I, I, is it a fair assessment to say that those were fast runners for those who, i know it's not everybody that know remembers uh carl lewis so but the, the point is if you put the name of um, a, if you put the name of let's say someone like um, Bill Gates and you put it together with Jeff Bezos, is it a fair assessment to say that they're kind of on the same level, so to speak? Is is it fair to say that? Hello, please respond back. We're family. We're talking. I'm not trying to. Um, I'm not loading things down your throat. Uh, I'm sharing by the Spirit of the Lord, and I'm going somewhere with this. When the Bible speaks and says. Uh, in, in Paul began to say something. He says that uh, if Paul plants and Apollo waters, but it's God that gives the increase. He puts the name of those two people. In another verse of scripture, he says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Who are they? It's God that is, takes priority. Do you understand? But the point was he began to compare those two individuals you do not compare people who are not on the same level with each other. I'm going some way. The man Apollos, the Bible says concerning him that he, was, he feared the Lord. He had known about the Lord, but he only knew about John the Baptist. And then these two people, Priscilla and Aquila, they listened to him, and then they called him, and then they showed him a more better way. And you know what happened? You know, if you're certain level in ministry and people you don't know before, they call you and quote unquote, they're kind of correcting you, you know, or trying to put you straight. You know, you could, some people could take offense at that. 
But the man Apollos did not take offense. The Bible says concerning him that after that incident, you know what he did? He was, the way he now, he knew more about the Lord Jesus Christ. He defended the gospel better. So when I say that, I want to encourage that every one of us here have a receptive mind. Be like Apollos. Be like Apollos. He was already a big man in the Lord, but he was humble enough to receive instruction. Irrespective of how long you've been in ministry, your experience, be like Apollos tonight. Be like Apollos, not just tonight. For the next three days, I want to encourage every one of us to take that trait of the man, the believer Apollos, and have a receptive mind. Have a receptive mind to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our midst. Amen? Amen. Is, that, is that an agreement? That, is that a, okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I'll give an example. Do you know that if you have a ship, uh, 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 a shipping vessel, so to speak, and that shipping vessel is anchored to the port, the goal of that shipping vessel is to go from one port, the, or the reason why, what the owners of the vessel, the shipping vessel, what they expect is that that vessel will car carry cargo, whether human passenger or, or goods, from one port to the other, and then come back. You either go to the port of Houston, Atlanta, or go to somewhere in China or the Middle East or any other country. It leaves the U.S., but it comes back. And when it comes back to the port, you know what happens? It is anchored to the pier. Are you with me still? The shipping vessel is anchored to the pier. Now, the wind will blow that vessel. But the fact that that vessel is anchored to the pier, no matter how much the wind blows, that vessel will go far. But because it's anchored, it will come back. You are that shipping vessel. The wind of life will blow you. Will blow you and I. It will blow you and I. Normal things will happen to us. And the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, they will also try as well to blow us. But in as much as we are anchored to the Lord, no matter what tries to blow us, the fact that you are anchored to the Lord you have the seal of Jesus upon you. You've been bought with a price. You are not your own. Jesus owns you and I. So take courage, take a, uh, encouragement in that, that you are anchored in the Lord, especially as a minister. Especially as a minister, you are anchored in the Lord. And so no matter what blows in ministry, no matter what happens in ministry, in as much as you are anchored to the pure, <laughs> the wind, it will happen. The Bible says that tribulation will come. It comes to the good and to the, it happens to us all. But we should rejoice because we have overcome the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, I know Reverend Arami says he's not going to give definition, but I mean, I'm going to give you definition. And the reason why I'm giving definition is one of the things I learned is that um, in order to walk with the things of God, it's very important that not just your spirit understands it, but your mind as well has to understand it. Remember the title is The Role of Prayer in Prioritizing and Strategizing for Effectiveness and Efficiency in Ministries. That is very long. It's, it's kind of very long-winded, meaning that some of us can probably grasp it, but sometimes it's very good to turn things into bite size that your mind can understand your spirit already understands it, but does your mind understand it? Now, we could nod our head that, oh, I get, I get the general gist of what you're trying to say. But it's very un important that our mind grasp it. And why, why, why do I say that? You know, in, scripture, in Corinthians, Paul was saying, he says, I will pray with what? The understanding. But I will also pray with the spirit. A lot of us, with all due respect, some people, just some believers, you know, even ministers, just believe that, hey, I just need to pray in the Holy Ghost only. But there's a reason why we pray with the understanding, and there's a reason why we pray with the Holy Ghost. There's a re it's very, there's no, there is, there's no fight. Let's put it this way. There's no fight between those two activities. 
And do you know when in Proverbs 4 20, that tells us that the guard your heart with all what diligence for out it are the issues of life. So the central place for you and I to guard is our hearts. Is that right? Okay. I'm going somewhere. Now, the salvation experience, it had to do with two things. It had to do with our mouth and it had to do with our hearts. The Bible says that we believed on the Lord in our heart and confession is made with our mouth unto what? Unto salvation. So those two parts of our person work together for a salvation experience to happen. To continue to thrive or be successful in ministry, there must be an agreement between what our mouth is saying and what is, our heart is saying. There has to be an agreement because those two aspects of our person they have to do with life. They have to do with the generation of, of, of life that would, that would make a difference. When you, you pray with your mouth, but you are convinced in your heart. So it's not enough to just pray and say things with our mouth relating to where we believe the Lord is guiding us or leading us, our family or ministry. It's very important that there's a conviction in our heart. There's an understanding of what the Lord is saying to us in our mind. And that way, when our mind has at least a little bit of understanding, a little bit of understanding, our spirit already understands. But if our mind has a little bit of understanding, then our mind can agree with our spirit or with our heart. And when we pray, there will be results. Does that make sense to us? I'll give us more examples, and, and we're going to use a, a few case studies. We're going to use a case. Remember, uh, let's look at the, mean, the definition of efficiency. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to give us a definition for efficiency here. The word efficiency has to do with um, your ability to accomplish something with the least wastage of time and effort. When you're saying you're doing something or doing ministry or doing life, for us to do ministry or to do life efficiently, our goal is that there be less wastage, wastage in time and effort. You'd be surprised how many times we, we just waste time and effort in ministry and we cover it and say it's the Holy Spirit. We lie on God a lot, but hey, it happens. You know, you get the definition of efficiency. Let me give us the definition of effectiveness. Effectiveness has to do the degree to which something is successful in producing a desired result. The definition of effi effectiveness is the degree to which something is successful in producing a desired result. You say, man of God, you're a prophet. You're giving us so many definitions. You're just kind of, are you trying to confuse us? Oh, no, no, that's not the goal. I want to try to help us to condense the title of the message. Uh, if you're a minister here, we're trying to figure out, so what is the, how do I prioritize prayer in doing this thing called ministry? How do I prioritize prayer in, do, in, in taking care of my family, my marriage, my home, how do I prioritize prayer as a student? How, how do I do that effectively? And how do I do that? Let me further con condense that, uh, the title of this message. We're trying to see how prayer can help you and I to succeed with less waste of time. Does that make more sense than the other definition? How can prayer help me to succeed in ministry of life, ministry or life, with less wasti wasting of time? One person, I, I use a, let me start off with Moses. Moses knew, had an idea in his heart that God, now, some people, you might think, okay, this, man, this man of God is not opening the Bible or quoting scripture. I want to encourage you to please Google if, you, if I tell you a scripture, you know, Google it. Okay? 
Google it. I'm, I probably will give us scriptures at some point in time. I'm working based on the time I have. I prepared a two-hour message, but I have to give the message in less than 30 minutes to make sure I'm working in obedience. Okay? So, I'm, uh, how do I put it? I'm not going to tell you something that is not scripturally based. And if I do say something that is not scripturally based, I give permission to those who are senior than me or younger than me in ministry to correct me. Is that okay? I will not take offense. But I, I, don't, I don't plan to do that. Okay? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. I said the man Moses our, is our senior colleague. Let me put it that way. It's, you know, our older brother, Moses, in the Bible. You know what? He knew in his heart that ah, God has called him. He didn't, he didn't exactly get it, but he just knew that God placed him in Egypt to save the children of Israel before God appeared to him. So based on that perception, he stepped out and he killed somebody that was fighting with an Israelite. Is that, a, is that biblically correct? Hello? You're not responding. No. I'll fight you. So he killed somebody because he thought that the, his fellow Israelites would realize that even though he looks like an Egyptian, but he's really one of them. Okay? So he killed that person. Then another day, Two Israelites were fighting. So he tried to separate them. Hey, listen, you guys are brothers. Why are you fight? They said, who made you a judge of ours? Are you going to kill us like you kill the other? So he knew that that news has already spread. And what did he do? He ran away. He ran away to the land of Midian. Obviously, the story, fast forward, he got married. Uh, Jethro, Jethro's daughter. He had children there. And then one day, the Bible says that a bush was born in, and then he turned aside to see. Because he was surprised, how can a bush be born in and the, 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 uh, it's not consumed? So he turned around to see. Then the Bible says in that portion of scripture in Exodus that because he turned around to see, God now spoke to him. Just as a point of correction, Moses had more or less, you know, you think that that desire... I meant to save these people. What's going on? It was all still running. So curiosity made Moses to turn around. And the Bible says that because he turned around, God now spoke to him. The two ties together. He turned aside to see. He was curious or he was expectant of something that, this is not normal. So when he turned aside, that was when God began to speak to him. When some of us would turn around aside out of the business of your daily activities, what's going on with you? You turn around, you just notice that it seems God is speaking through me, maybe through a TV program or through some people that are conversing. You just turn aside to hear God. That might be a pivotal moment in your life. Let me get back to Moses. Remember Moses, Zaki? We're trying to see how do we. We've changed the title of the message, if you don't realize it. How do we succeed in, in life and ministry with less wastage of time? Uh, it's not longer that big word there, that grammatically. It's correct, too. But for those of us who are very cerebral, that's a good title. Okay? So how do you succeed in ministry or in your marriage or in life or as a student with less wastage of your time? How do, how do you use prayer to succeed in all aspects of your life? Amen? Okay. So we see Moses, he began first of all, he did not pray, but he knew he was called. And he failed. Did he fail or did he didn't fail? So if you, you know God is calling you to do something, God is with you, uh, people around you tell you, to, and you know whether you're a pastor or a church leader, or a, family, a mother or a father, uh, and you want to start a family, or whatever you want to start in life. And as a believer, if you do not, you just assume, well, God is with me, jump into it. I'm, it's not a cause, so most likely you will fail. It's not, I'm not cursing any one of us. The Bible says, commit your what? Walk unto the Lord. And he will do what? Establish the thoughts of your mind. When you start ministry, commit it unto the Lord in the place of prayer. 
then there are those of us, like in the case of Moses, he had already, in his way, he's already started. He's fumbled, made so many mistakes. Even he killed somebody. And expecting that, ah, maybe that's the way God wants to use me. But that wasn't the way God wanted to use him initially. And when he now turned aside, God told him, take off the sandals of your feet. Because where the ground that you're standing is holy, what? Holy ground. So Moses now began the process of ministry after he had fumbled. He now began it properly. He didn't take any step going forward. From that time, moment onwards, he will pray. He will seek the face of the Lord. The fact that uh, when he goes, when you go into the temple and the veil is already is covering us, Reverend told us, he spent time in the presence of God. What are you doing in the presence of God? You're praying, you're talking to God, you're conversing, you're hearing the Lord. You understand? Is it right to say prayer kind of is involved in when you're in the presence of God? Is it, is it a correct assertion? Hello, is it a correct statement to make? That when you're in the presence of God, that's a place to pray. And I, and I, well, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Let me, let me leave that. So, going forward, you notice that the life, the trajectory of the life of Moses changed. The moment he now began to put God first and not try to do it in his own strength. Amen? I want to make a... <laughs> It's not a it's not a it's a simple statement. The church is a spiritual organization. The church is spiritual, but it's a spiritual organization that is working in an in the natural realm. So the goal of those of us who are leaders, or if you're part of the church, when it comes to prayer. What you want to do is you want to go recognizing that the church is spiritual. You want to hear from the spirit realm what you instructions that are natural, that can be naturally communicated. Does that make sense? You don't go to hear from the spirit of the Lord spiritual things and communicate them to people in a spiritual way. Because they won't understand you. They will tell you you're mad. I, I, the people that will tell you you're mad, I'm not talking even non-Christians, but Christians will tell you that you're mad as their leader. Uh, no, they won't say that you're mad to your face. They will say, Pastor, praise the Lord for your life. That's a coded way of saying that, Pastor, is everything okay with you? Amen? Praise the Lord. And, and no offense, I'm also a leader in the body of Christ. But the point is, when we pray as ministers to see, and, and this is not your usual prayer, and I'll explain that for when we pray, seeking the face of God, what we are doing is not to uh, is not to receive power. I, and I have to be careful when saying that, but the, uh, it's not to receive power. I, sir, I thank you so much for that song. We're praying. What did our, the instruction our Lord Jesus Christ gave the church? I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap, wrap this up. You know what he said when he, when he had resurrected? You know what he said? He said, wait or tarry in Jerusalem until what? Or you sh until you receive power. Basically power to minister. It's not a I, I didn't say that. It's in the Bible. If you don't believe me, go and Google it. Okay? Because that's, how I, that's the way I have to communicate to our children now. You know, a lot of them don't really... They read their Bible, you know, but they can, you can Google it. You just a vast a portion of it uh, are taught, and you'll be surprised how you'll find it. And then you can now go into the Bible and see where exactly it is. Amen? I do it sometimes. Yeah, but I, but I know my Bible shall, but I still do it sometimes. Amen? Wait, when he sang that, I don't mind waiting. That was just confirmation of what the Holy Spirit is telling. Are you a minister? Are you a parent? Concerning your children, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord for directions concerning their lives, what they're going to be, what God wants to do with them. Wait on the Lord in the place of prayer concerning your family, concerning your marriage. Wait on the Lord. Concerning ministry, 
wait on the Lord. And it was clear, waiting is not just prayer. Because we are told that they were, after, Jesus, after the, our Lord Jesus Christ had resurrected and, and gone, to heaven, gone back to heaven, they were rejoicing, they were happy they, in the upper room, and they were praying together, they were singing unto the Lord. And that was their posture of waiting. So worship, prayer, are postures of waiting. Spend quality time in prayer. Spend quality time in prayer. You see, another individual, Nehemiah, do you remember that after they brought the news to Nehemiah that ah, Jerusalem has been destroyed? Though. He was very sad. But he prayed and he did what? He fasted. That was the first thing Nehemiah did. And then the king saw him one day that, ah, why? You are sad. And he was afraid. The reason why he was afraid was because in that, those times, you, you do not come before a king with sadness. That can cost you your life, literally. So he was a servant. He was a poor bearer to the king, cup bearer to the king. So he said, why wouldn't I be sad? My people have been destroyed. And as though the spirit, not as though, the spirit of the Lord was in control of that situation. And you know what? The king now said, so what do you want to see happen? Ah, open check. The king gave him an open check. And then he sent him back. He now went. You, the, the rest is history. But he began, re, Nehemiah began the process of rebuilding the wall. Now, let me go to Apostle Paul. Remember what we're saying. How do you use prayer to be successful? So Nehemiah prayed, right? He prayed. Is that correct? He fasted. And he got instruction on what to do. And he went about it. And the first thing he even went to do, he didn't, he didn't start speaking to people. He went around with the men that came with him just to assess what is the need, what is going on, before he now began to speak to the people. The same thing with Apostle Paul. This man, when he was sore, before he got combined again, you know, he was somebody that in his mind, I'm serving God. As far as he was concerned, based on the ways of the Pharisees, he was serving God as far as he was concerned. Now, something now happened on the way to Damascus. Is that correct? A bright light shone to him. Paul, so, so, why are you persecuting me? Ah, who are you, Lord? Ah. And you know, afterwards, you know what he first did? In scripture, he was saying this. He said that I didn't consult with any man, but he went to Arabia for the space of three years. I, I, no, eight years. Just to seek God. Then after that, he now came to Jerusalem. He didn't speak, to, and then hung out with the apostles for 14 days. Amen? So that the things that he'll be, he's saying or he's hearing, he wants to come, make sure he's not speaking heresy. When you are called to ministry, no matter the level, your first assignment is to seek the face of God. Especially in this day and age, you have to decide how do you want to wait on the Lord? Because, and waiting on the Lord is an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time instruction from God for your family or for ministry. So some of us, I want to, you might need to, some of us, the, based on our schedule, it might be that we'll break the year into two. So every six months for about one week, you just go away to, you look at the vision and, and your, your journal. And you go, you seclude yourself, maybe a prayer mountain or, or, or a hotel or getaway place where you're not distracted. And you seek, begin to wait on the Lord in the place of prayer. It's not waiting that you're praying to give out, but you're praying to receive. There are two levels of prayer. There's a prayer whereby you give out and there's a prayer whereby you receive. The Bible speaks about building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's the prayer to what? To receive. Does that make sense to us? The prayer to give out when you engage in prayer warfare. I don't want to call it spiritual warfare. Because even living itself is spiritual warfare. But I'm just being semantically correct. Okay? So when you engage in prayer warfare, you, you find virtue will leave you. So you're giving out. So to know which prayer, when you're singing unto the Lord or worshiping the Lord in the place of prayer, that is what? Taking in virtue. Taking in strength. So there are two types. Of, when you pray, after you've prayed, whether you pray in tongues or you pray in a known language, understanding, how do you feel afterwards? Do you feel as if you're weak or you feel empowered? If you feel physically weak, you're probably giving out in prayer. That makes sense to us? 
Now, ah, uh, man. Oh, praise the Lord. I'll just take five minutes and try to wrap this up. Every single one of us, it's very important, no matter whether you've been in ministry for long or recently, it's very important that we take time to wait. I said some people, based on your schedule, you can just do it probably twice a year. Some people, you might want to do it quarterly, every three months. You go back to the Lord, it might be just for a few days, three days. Some people, it might be just three to, uh, four times a year, every four months, okay? But the point is, it's very important. Even as a student, even as a young person, you know, when you get to that crossroad whereby you're going to go into high school or you're going further into college, wait on the Lord. Before you take the next step in your life, in your journey, whether ministry or in your, in your family, if, you're gonna, if you notice that you all are going to make, be making a major decision soon, create time intentionally it might some of us it might just be one day and then what do you do just wait on the lord and the, the concept behind waiting on the lord is to hear him and you'll be surprised when you wait on the lord there'll be less wasted there'll be less wasting of time you chances are you'll be more successful in the things that you want to do yes you're called by god but if you don't add prayer to it you just be beating around the bush and wasting time, wasting anointing, wasting effort. And I want to encourage everyone to be secure in who you are. Pastor Adeye said that. I said, I'm a prophet. I'm not a pastor. Be secure in who you are. Be, stay in your lane. Know the grace. Are you a pastor, a teacher, apostle, prophet, or, or evangelist? Know who you are. Because the grace that will be on your life is based off of who you are. If you try to... Follow the template of another person to do life or ministry. It's a very dangerous thing. Because you're a peculiar person, a royal, called unto the Lord. So every single one of us in this place, it's very, very important. Seek the face of the Lord for your life. Make it a habit, an ongoing and get instruction, and you'll be surprised how you'll be progressing step, stage by stage. I want to wrap up with this. Um, sir, I'm going to talk on you. I know you do like this. That song, you're going to sing it again. And this is what we're going to practically do. It's going to be, I'll just take two minutes and we'll be done. Two minutes with this, we'll be done. Um, remember I said the church is spiritual. It's not, but we receive instruction from the spirit to do things in the physical realm, Okay. Now, I was waiting on the Lord, you know, and praying and fasting as the usual. He said, tell this morning, very early this morning, I'm kind of wrapping up. Sir, you could come join me, sir. It's, uh, and sir, I need the anointing oil. And if uh, I kind of told him, bring the anointing oil. Please, if you're not comfortable with this, uh, tomorrow when you come, if you're not comfortable uh, receiving the anointing oil that will be passed around, uh, tomorrow when you come, bring your own anointing oil if you're not comfortable receiving it. Okay, and um, so we're going to pass the anointing oil. I, I really would love for us to do it today because I kind of like, I'm trying to, I'm, up, I'm walking in obedience. Let me put it that way. The Bible says that they waited on the Lord. They tarried in Zion for about 50 days thereabout. They were waiting. And then one of those days as they were waiting, doing just that waiting, then the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were empowered to do what our lord jesus christ commanded them to do occupy occupy till i come occupy till i come you and i need to be empowered to occupy we need to be empowered to live life to do ministry and to do that we have to wait wait it entails praying it entails praying not, it's not the usual prayer. I said I was going to mention one more prayer. And uh, let me mention it briefly. You have to learn like those three Hebrew boys. The Bible says about them that they purposed in their hearts not to defile themselves with the food of Babylon. So they were fasting and they ate a different type of meal. That purpose, uh, to purpose in your heart has to do with conviction 
the woman Hannah, she had been praying for a child for a long time. But at one day, she prayed. And that prayer was different. Someone, uh, Eli now asked her, what's wrong with you? Why, you know, she said, from the anguish of my heart, I was praying. They will get, a day must come in your life, in my life. Where you get, as they normally, you know, they say, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you now cry unto the Lord. That Lord, if you do this for me, this is what I'm going to be doing for you. That is what I like to call a prayer vow. I want to encourage every one of us to make a prayer vow. And it's not, a, it's not your usual prayer. Something has to pain you in your heart. Something has to have happened to you and that you are so convinced. I give a short testimony. I mean, I'm beginning to sound like a preacher. God forgive me. I'm, gonna, I'm still within time with all due respect. And then we'll do this. This pastor, I know, I'm not going to mention his name. He looked, he's here in Dallas. He said, he looked around him. Potter's house, Bishop T.D. Jakes is here. Pastor Tony Evans, O'Cliff Bible Fellowship is here. He felt miserable. That what's going on? I'm in the midst of great men. How will my church grow? And you know what he did? He was waiting on the Lord. And he made a prayer vow that God I'm going to pursue your presence. He believed the Holy Spirit spoke it to him. I'm going to ensure that my place is a place of the marketplace. I'm going to ensure that legacy, legacy, family, we value family in this place. And he began to just, those simple instructions, he made a vow with God that no matter how big or how small we are, no matter what happens, your presence will not joke with. And do you know today as we speak, <laughs> they have a church in Frisco, they've opened a church in Meadow Glen, they've opened a church in downtown, they've opened, you know, and I'm like, I remember what that man of God said. He was frustrated and then he made a prayer vow. So for us who are ministers here or for us, if you don't have a child and you want a child, make a prayer vow like Hannah. Uh, I, I want to wrap up with that because I'm a man under authority. So, Pastor is going to sing that song. And I know it's, but it's the principle of waiting that we're doing. And afterwards, we're going to receive the anointing oil and you just put it on your head. So, sir, can you just go around, kind of give it to, pour it to their hands, people's hands around, if you don't mind. You are going to with your don't put don't put your hands on your head yet. Don't put your hands on your head yet. Amen. Thank Go you, ahead, Jesus. Sir. How many are gonna wait on him tonight? Come on, just lift your hands if you're gonna wait on him. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh you Lord. Oh I don't mind waiting. Don't mind waiting. Don't mind waiting on you, Lord. I don't mind waiting. Don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. I don't mind waiting. Don't mind waiting. Come on, come on, come on. I don't mind waiting. If you don't mind waiting, come on, open your mouth and say, I don't mind. I don't mind waiting on your Lord. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind. I gotta wait. I gotta wait. strength I need if I hold on oh Lord hey don't mind don't mind don't mind don't mind I don't mind oh you Lord oh I don't mind wait don't mind wait I don't mind waiting on the 
hard sometimes, but I don't mind. I may have to wait by myself. I don't mind. Cause I believe what he said. Cause I believe the word. God's word says that those that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as an eagle. They will run, they won't grow weary. They will walk, they will not faint. Open your hands, please. And one of the things the Holy Spirit, especially those of us who are ministers here, the Holy Spirit says, Concerning the people, the flock that God has given to you or those who are aligned to you, don't ever put your hand this way over them. But come before him putting your hands this way. Because you are saying you are we are depending on God. You are not the CEO. In the kingdom of God, CEO means Christ executive officer. Jesus, Reverend Bank has said Jesus is the focus. So Jesus is the focus. If you could meet the needs of the people as a pastor, as a prophet, then <laughs> there's no need for God. But because you come representing the people before God, you come this way. The same way you come this way on your, for your own self. The Holy Spirit said we should come and open our hands and receive the anointing. We waited on the Lord, so to speak. We have to make it a habit, do you understand that? And so when you lay your hands on your head shortly, there will be a change that will happen. We'll be filled afresh and anew for the next level of ministry on one hand, for more opportunities, more doors tangible spiritually you will notice the difference one of the things that now i'm speaking as a prophet <laughs> you will notice the difference and that same change it will flow through your family your children those who are connected to you if there be any sickness or anything challenging whatever it is for the bible says that by reason of the anointing the yoke shall be destroyed and so, Father, we lay our hands on our head. Lay your hands on your head. Lord, do what you alone can do. I can't do <laughs> anything. We are not the ones who feel ourselves. It is you, Holy Spirit, who feels us. And so, feel us. Feel us for the journey ahead. Feel us for the work that is ahead. Fill us for the next phase of life. Fill us to be more produ productive. Fill us to be more effective. Fill us to be more efficient. We thank you. Fill us to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I don't mind waiting. Amen.